All right, so yesterday we talked about redistricting, and we talked about the perverse form of redistricting would be gerrymandering, the drawing of the district lines in order to give an advantage to a particular party. Um, today, I want a, a quick refresher about the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is the most important amendment in this class because it holds two clauses that are very important for us, the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Today, all I care about is you know what the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment does. What does the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment do? What does it guarantee? Equal representation. Correct. What does the Equal Protection Clause do? No state, no government can deprive anyone of equal protection of the law. What that means is no government can do what? Segregate, discriminate. Discriminate is the right word there. Equal protection clause prevents any government from discriminating upon its own citizens, especially the state governments. Make sure you remember that about the equal protection clause. It's very important for today because our two, the next two cases that we're going to talk about, Supreme Court cases that we're going to talk about, deals with the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. These are required cases in AP government, just like McCulloch versus Maryland and U.S. versus Lopez. You're going to need to know these. You're going to need to know the facts behind them and what the Supreme Court decided in each one of these cases. So our first case is Baker versus Carr. The state of Tennessee has not redistricted, has not redrawn those lines for their state legislatures in a while. Not for the U.S. House of Representatives, like what we talked about yesterday, for their own state Congress, for their own state legislatures. They have not redrawn, um, the, they have not redistricted in a while. How much? About 50 years. According to Tennessee law, they're supposed to redraw those lines every 10 years. But they haven't. As a result, by the time it's 1990, what happened to some of those districts? Some districts grown a lot in population and some districts didn't. Which means, what? The population in each one of those districts in Tennessee for their state legislatures are what? They're different. Some districts have grown a lot, some districts didn't. So some districts have a high population, some districts have very low population. In districts like in big cities like in Memphis, Tennessee, their populations are a lot compared to the districts in the rural and farming areas of Tennessee. So why is this a problem, guys? Each one of those districts is going to have to elect how many representatives to their state legislature? How many representatives does each district get? One. It doesn't matter how much populated your district is or how little populated it is, you get one representative. So this is not fair for who? The districts with bigger populations. If I have a district, if I was in a district with 5,000 people, and there's another district in farming areas that only have 500 people. How many representatives do we get as 5,000 people? We only get one representative, one vote in our in our Texas in our state Tennessee legislature, and these guys also get one. It's inherently unfair. Their vote don't count as much as their vote. This makes sense for everybody. So what's the complaint? That the state of Tennessee, by not redistricting these districts is committing an act of what? An act of discrimination. By making these people's vote count less than these guys vote, they're discriminating, they're treating them unequally, they're treating them unfairly. So that's the complaint of people from Tennessee, I mean from Memphis, Tennessee. That by Tennessee not redrawing the lines in a while, they're making their vote count less than other people's vote which is inherently discriminatory. This is a form of discrimination. Which means what's involved? The 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, the Constitution of the United States is involved. Maybe. Here's the problem that the people of Tennessee are facing. There have been redistricting cases before that are brought up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court almost every single time have said, we're not going to touch that. We're not, we don't have authority over that. 
Like for example, gerrymandering cases. People have complained about gerrymandering to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court hasn't done anything. Why? Because they believe that's not part of their authority. Here's why. The Supreme Court only answers legal questions, questions that has to do with the law or constitutional questions, questions that have to do with the Constitution. And for the Supreme Court, redistricting, this isn't a legal question, this isn't a constitutional question, this is between Republicans and Democrats trying to one-up each other. This is a political question. And the Supreme Court does not play with politics. They don't have authority over politics. So the problem the people of Tennessee had is, case after case before Baker versus Carr, the Supreme Court dismissed those cases because they felt like they did not have power over those cases because they're not about the Constitution and they're not about the law. Anyone have, anyone have any questions so far? So the first thing the Supreme Court has to decide is, do they even have authority over redistricting? Do they even have power over redistricting cases? Because the Supreme Courts before have said, no, we don't have power over those things. Because it's not a legal question, it's not a constitutional question. Number two, if they do have authority over that, then what Tennessee do? Is this discrimination? Is this a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause? So, we have to take a look at what they decided. Number one, they said the court can rule on redistricting cases. The court can rule on redistricting cases. The court can rule on redistricting cases. Oh, I found this adorable. Okay. As long as, as long as it has to do with discrimination. Guys, this is a big moment. This is why this case is so important in this class. Before Baker versus Carr, the Supreme Court has dismissed all redistricting cases brought up to it. Here you go, Ray. They dismiss all redistricting cases brought up to it. This is reversing a trend, just like what U.S. versus Lopez did with the Commerce Clause. Baker versus Carr reversed the trend of the Supreme Court not touching redistricting cases. Now the Supreme Court is claiming, yes, we have power over redistricting cases if it has to do with discrimination. If it has, because if it has to do with discrimination, you bring in what document? It's connected to what document? The Constitution of the United States, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment is involved. And the Supreme Court answers constitutional questions. Does that make sense for everybody? When before the Supreme Court said redistricting is about politics, we don't play politics, we don't engage in politics, we don't support Democrats or Republicans. Now, because redistricting is connected to discrimination, it's connected to the Constitution's 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So now who can get involved and decide on that case? The judicial. the judicial branch of the Supreme Court of the United States can. Anyone have any questions? So the first, the first decision was, yes, they can rule over this case. Because it has to do with discrimination, it has to do with the 14th Amendment. The second question is, is what Tennessee did, or didn't do, which is not redistrict for a while, is that a violation, is that a discrimina uh, is that discrimination? Yes. Because if it is, it would be against what? It would be a violation of the Constitution's 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. And the Supreme Court decided that, yes, indeed, that was a form of discrimination, that was a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Anyone have any questions over this? This is when the Supreme Court, remember this for Baker versus Carr, the Supreme Court established one person, one vote. When you're drawing these lines, you cannot make a person's vote count less than another person's vote. One person, one vote. Which means, when you're drawing these lines, all of your districts must have what? Equal. Approximately equal population. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, because that would be impossible, but approximately they should have equal uh, population. Because if it's unequal, then it's not one person, one vote. You're making someone else's vote count less. Does that make sense for everybody? Why does Tennessee have to do that? Why do they have to make their districts equal? Because otherwise, it would be what? It would be discriminatory. It would be discrimination. Does that make sense for everybody? This scared off a lot of states. After this case and after this decision was handed out, a lot of states, including our state, realized, oh, some of our districts don't have equal population. So 
a lot of these states, to avoid getting in trouble with the Supreme Court, they redrew their district lines to make them more equal in population. Anyone have any questions? That's why yesterday, when I asked you guys to draw those district lines, what did I tell you the one rule was? They need to have what? Equal population. They need to be connected and they need to have equal population. It's because of this case. Before this case, you could have gotten away with making them unequal. This case made that happen. That's the rule that this case um, put up there when it comes to redistricting. So it opened the doors for, and probably the most important thing, nowadays, if you have a complaint about redistricting, the Supreme Court is not just going to automatically dismiss it. The Supreme Court can take a look at that case if it has to do with what? Discrimination. It all starts from here. Just like the Commerce Clause being limited um, by the U by U.S. versus local, <coughs> this opens the door for equal protection challenges about regarding redistricting. Anyone have any questions, Baker versus Carr? Make sure you can describe this to me and to your AP graders. You don't need to remember the name of the state. The state is Tennessee, but you don't need to remember that. A certain state has not redis redistricted for their state legislatures in a while, resulting in their districts being what? Being what? Before that, an equal in population, which some people felt like is, is what? Discrimination. However, the Supreme Court hasn't really decided on redistricting cases because they felt before that it, redistricting cases are what? They're political. They're, it's about politics. And they only answer legal or constitutional questions. And then you go into how they decide it. They can decide on this case because it has to do with what? Discrimination, which means the 14th Amendment of the Constitution is involved. And number two, it is discrimination because they're making someone's vote count less than another person's vote, which would be against the 14th Amendment. Any questions about this case? All right, let's go to the next case. Also about redistricting, Shaw versus Brigham. This case is weird. It took place in North Carolina. North Carolina, after the recent census, I think this was in 19... 93. After recent census, redrew their district lines after the 1990 census. They redrew the district lines. What they found out is, oh, by the way, you need to know this word, majority minority districts. Majority minority districts are districts with a majority, where the minorities are in the majority. Where the minority population is greater than whites. That's probably a better way to put it. And the minority population is greater than whites. Okay. So North Carolina redrew their district lines, and what they found out was after they redrew it, there's only one minority majority district. There's only one district where there are more African Americans than white people. North Carolina, like our state, we've often gotten in trouble with the Supreme Court before because we're pretty racist, and we've often gotten in trouble because of the 14th Amendment. So North Carolina got scared. After redrawing the lines, there's only one predominantly African American district out of, out of all the districts that they have in North Carolina. So they thought, Ooh, if we keep this, we're going to get in trouble with the Supreme Court again. They're going to think we're being racist again. We're, they're going to think we're being discriminatory again. So they had a second draft, and they approved that second draft. And what they did is they added a new district that would be minority majority. So they would have two minority majority districts instead of one. I'm good so far. The intention was okay. The intention was give more representation for African Americans. Anybody can guess which district was added? That purple violet. The purple violet one doesn't make any sense. This is the district that was drawn. They drew it through African American neighborhoods. They just connected a bunch of African American neighborhoods together to create a new minority majority district in the state. We see that purple one, right? That's what they do. Now, I'm good so far. White people in the state of North Carolina began to complain. They said, our state is separating us according to what? Color. According to color, according to race. What's that? That's, that's segregation. Our government is separating us, making these districts according to race. This is segregation. 
So it's ironic why people are complaining about being discriminated upon, but that's what they felt. So they sued the state of Tennessee, and we get ourselves Shaw versus Ruth. Going good so far. The question the Supreme Court has to answer is this. Is this state right here, oh, I'm sorry, is that district right there drawn based entirely on race? And if it is, is that a form of discrimination? Because if it is, it would be a violation of the Constitution's what? 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So they have to answer two questions. Was this district, was the intention, was the motivation behind it to draw it entirely based on race? And number two, if that is the case, is that a form of discrimination? All right, so here's what the Supreme Court decided. They decided that the shape of that district is so odd, it's so misshapen, it's so oddly shaped, that there could, they cannot find any other factor, they cannot find any other reason why this state exists, I'm sorry, district exists, other than what? race. The only factor that was used to draw that district is race. Geography didn't play a part, obviously. Nothing else played a part. It's just race. This district was entirely created based on race. That was the only factor that North Carolina used to draw that district. Number two, yes indeed, this is a form of discrimination because this is segregation. One of the justices even said, this is uncomfortably very familiar, this is uncomfortably very close to apartheid. You know what apartheid? World history? South Africa? I'm not gonna explain world history. <laughs> so, basically segregation. So they said, this is a form of discrimination and this is a violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. So here's what you need to remember. North Carolina did draw it based entirely on race, according to the Supreme Court. And number two, that action is unconstitutional because it, it's equivalent to segregation. It's against the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. All right, here's what you need to remember, though, guys. This case made racial gerrymandering or racial do redistricting, which is drawing those lines based on what? Based only on race, unconstitutional. Racial redistricting is unconstitutional. A state cannot draw a district based entirely on race. But the key word there, guys, is entirely. Race can still be a factor, but it cannot be the only factor. So a state can still use race as a factor, which they do. They did it to you guys. But it cannot be the only factor when they're drawing these lines because that would be equivalent to what? Discrimination or segregation, which is against what? 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Anyone have any questions over this case? All right, I wanna go back to an idea that we talked about before, which is divided government. A divided government can mean two things, either Congress or the President are controlled by different parties, or one of the houses of Congress is controlled by one party, and the President of the United States uh, is from another party. What do we have today? The first one or the second example? The second example. We still have a divided government, but this is the divided government that we have. The House of Representatives is controlled by the Democrats, while the presidency is uh, controlled by the Republicans. What did I tell you about policy making when divided government takes place? So it's very difficult. So difficulty creating policy because there's extreme partisanship, especially nowadays. Republicans and Democrats are farther apart on what they believe in than ever before. It's hard for them to come into agreement on things, which makes policy making very difficult. James Madison's system of separation of powers and checks and balances demands compromise. It requires it. And if we have people in government that can't come up with a compromise, then it doesn't work. It's gridlock. That's the problem that we have today. Separation powers and checks and balances, it requires them to negotiate, it requires them to um, come together and compromise, give up some of the things that they believe in. But today, it's very hard to do that because they're so far apart in what they believe in. 
everything becomes more difficult when we have a divided government. Things that the president wants to do, presidential initiatives, like the border wall, for example, that's going to be harder to accomplish if we have a divided government. That's why it hasn't been accomplished. There are things right now that Donald Trump wants to do, presidential initiatives that he wants to do, that he's not going to be able to do because the House of Representatives is controlled by one party. If you're a Democrat, that's a good thing for you. If you're a Republican, that's a bad thing because you want your president to accomplish the things he wants to accomplish. Next, legislation is going to be harder to pass. If those two, those two branches don't agree with each other, lawmaking is hard. Because what does the president do with laws that Congress passes at the end? What can he do? It? He can just veto. It's harder to get things done. And finally, every year, Congress and the president has to negotiate the budget and the appropriations bills. That happens every year. And if we have a divided government, that's going to be harder to accomplish. I think last year, we had, a, we had a shutdown, we had a government shutdown for a while, and that's because we had a divided government. It's harder to get a budget passed, it's harder to get appropriations bills passed, if we have a divided government. Which means, it's more likely that a shutdown will happen if there is a divided government. Alright, treaties made or negotiated by the President of the United States, that's going to be harder to accomplish. Why? The president creates those treaties, but who needs to approve them? Congress. Congress, specifically which house? The Senate, the U.S. Senate. Right now, Donald Trump should have an easy time getting his treaties ratified by the Senate because the Senate is controlled by who? Well, by the Republicans. But in 2020, we give control of the Senate to the Democrats during the election, then treaties made by President Trump are going to be harder to get ratified. What else is going to get harder? What else does the Senate have to approve besides treaties? Appointments. The President of the United States appoints a lot of people to the federal judiciary of the federal government. Give me three appointments the President can make. Three. Judges is one to the judicial branch, judges and justices. What else? Ambassadors and heads of agencies, heads of um, federal agencies. All of those have to be confirmed by who? By the Senate. Right now, Trump has an easy time getting his, con their, his nominations confirmed, his appointments confirmed, because the Senate is controlled by the Republicans. If you want to check the President of the United States, if you don't like him, then vote Democrat. If you want the President of the United States to have an easy time with treaties and appointments, vote Republican. All right, there's another concept I need to talk to you about, and that is, what is a lame duck president? This is a possibility this year of having a lame duck president. Anybody know what a lame duck president is? All right, I'll explain. Once the election, when we're gonna select our president this year, but when? November. So the election is in November. So in November, we're gonna find out if Donald Trump keeps his seat or Donald Trump gets replaced. Let's say, for example, Donald Trump loses and whoever the Democrat shows is, is going to win. Let's say it's Bernie Sanders that wins the, the election next year. So he's president already. He's elected in November. But he doesn't take office until when? January. January. Until the next year in January. Which means between November and January, who's still the president of the United States? Donald Trump. Donald Trump is still the president of the United States. However, we call him a lame duck president because his successor has already been chosen. His replacement has already been chosen. But go with that so far. In 2016, between November 2016 and January uh, 2017, Obama was a lame duck president because Donald Trump has already been elected. His replacement has already been elected. So here's the thing. When you're a lame duck president, it's even harder for you to get things done. Because Congress is, not, is going to be less willing to help you out with the laws you want to pass, with the initiatives you want to do. Congress is going to be less willing to help out. Why? Because for them, you don't have legitimacy anymore. Your successor has already been chosen. You're just there filling up a seat. So you're going to have a harder time getting Congress to be on board. Because you're apparently a lame duck president. Even though you're still president of the United States, you're just there, you're just counting down the days in office. 
Congress is going to be less likely to help you out with the things that you want. So laws are going to be harder to pass. Um, appointments are going to be harder to get confirmed. Treaties are going to be harder to get ratified because they feel like you're just filling up someone else's seat. There's a perception like that. I'm going to give you an extreme case of this. Anybody know how many judges or justices are in the Supreme Court right now? In the Supreme Court? Nine. There are nine justices in the Supreme Court. Whenever one of them dies or whenever one of them retires, whose responsibility is it to replace that person? For the President of the United States, with the advice and the consent of the Senate, with the Senate's confirmation. So, early 2016, one of the Supreme Court justices, Antonin Scalia, died. A uh, heart attack. So that was in around June, around the summer of 2016. Is Obama a lame duck president yet? No, he's not. His successor hasn't been chosen yet. Not at that time. So Obama chooses one guy to replace Anthony Scalia. He chooses a guy named Merrick Garland to become a Supreme Court justice. Is he in the Supreme Court today? No. He's not. At the time, like today, the Senate was controlled by the Republicans. And the Senate kept saying, Obama is a lame duck president, even though it was still barely Jew. He's a lame duck president. We're not going to do it. We're not going to confirm his appointment. We're just going to wait. We're going to wait until the election, and we're going to let the next president of the United States. Can't talk to Gage for like being All that. No, 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 no. We're going to we're going to wait for the next president of the United States to go ahead and pick the replacement for Anthony Scalia. Even though he wasn't technically a lame duck president. So they waited months, they waited an entire year to get Anton Scalia replaced. It was a huge gamble though, because if in 2016 Hillary Clinton would have won, then she would have chosen the replacement. But the Senate's gamble paid off, and who won? Trump won, a Republican won. So their gamble actually paid off. They got a Republican to choose this um, Anthony Scalia's replacement. All right, anyone have any questions so far? All right, go to your unit two study guide for me, please. FRQ study guide. These are the questions that you can expect on Monday's test. Look at number one for me. Some of you have been getting these wrong on your homework. Do not just define them. It's okay to give me definitions. That's fine. It's not going to hurt you. But make sure you're actually answering the question, which is, what is their role in lawmaking? How are they involved in lawmaking? Anyone here are, is confused about any of these bullets? Guys, before you come into my class on Monday, make sure you know how a bill becomes a law. If you don't understand that process, you're going to be in trouble. If you don't know what each one of these do in the lawmaking process, you're going to be in trouble. Anyone have any questions? It's okay if you have a question, guys. So, uh, a person in here probably has the same questions as you do. You're probably helping them out. Everyone go with unanimous consent. Where does unanimous consent happen? <laughs> why we have a problem, guys. Ask, if you don't know, ask. Unanimous consent is how you end debates in the Senate. It means for debates to end the Senate floor and for it to go to a vote, what does unanimous mean? Everybody. Everybody is required to agree that the debate has to end and we need to move on to a vote. If even one person decides, no, we have to continue the debate, that is known as a hold, which is usually means that he's going to do a what? He's going to filibuster. How do you know there's no unanimous consent in the House of Representatives? Because debate only lasts as long as who wants it to last? As long as the House Rules Committee wants it to last. There's a debate limit, there's a time limit in the House of Representatives. Unlike in the Senate, that debate can go on indefinitely unless there's a unanimous consent. How do you defeat a filibuster? If someone does try to do a hold, how do you 60 vote closure? It's called a closure. Anyone else here have any questions? All right, a lot of you were getting this one wrong. 
expanding committees. Senate committees are where most of the work in legislation gets done. Um, whenever a bill gets proposed, it gets assigned to a standing committee so that they can do a hearing or a markup on it so that they can decide if it's a good enough bill to be um, reviewed by the entire House or by the entire Senate. Remember, standing committees are in charge of a specific policy area. Like the video I showed you the other day about the House Science and Technology Committee, they're in charge of the House Science and, and Technology Committee. They were talking about a bill, they were doing a hearing about a climate change bill. What do they bring in to talk about the bill? They bring in experts like scientists to talk about um, the climate change bill proposed by President Obama in that video. Does this make sense? They can debate, they can amend the bill, they can change the bill, but most of the work in legislation, it gets done there. Once they get done with a bill, the bill is pretty much the way it's going to be. All right, anyone else here? Any questions? Uh, committee as a whole, it's, it's committee as a whole, or committee as a whole. Um, it's the same thing as the House of Representatives. The House Rules Committee has a choice of releasing into the regular House of Representatives, which is usually the case, or releasing into the committee of the whole instead. What's the difference? No, no one's the only difference is the committee of the whole doesn't have a lot of procedures. It's not bogged down by a lot of rules. It doesn't mean it doesn't have any rules. It just means it doesn't have as many rules as the House of Representatives. Which means lawmaking in there is what? It's going to be easier, it's going to be faster. It's going to be more likely for that bill to get passed and to get passed quickly. Because it's not bogged down by all the rules of the House of Representatives. Even though it's the same thing, it's just called a different name. Anyone else? Right, conference committee um, is responsible for almost at the end of the process. After the Senate passes the bill and after the House of Representatives passes the bill, the two versions of those bills are going to be different because it's getting amended through committee and through the floor. Um, pork barrels and earmarks are getting added onto it. Um, so their job is to take the Senate version and the uh, House version and to reconcile the differences, to compromise the differences between those two versions and come up with one congressional version of the bill. That's their job, conference committee. Anyone else have any questions? Everyone go with discharge petition. Where does it exist? Um, it only exists in the House of Representatives. Only in the standing committees in the House. In the House standing committees, can you do a discharge petition? But make sure you know what that is. Anyone who does not know what that is? What is it required to do a discharge petition? A simple majority, which is 218 members of the House. Uh, let's go to number two. Anyone have any question with log rolling and riders? Both of these, make sure at the end you tell me how they affect the likelihood of bill passing. Both of these, how does it affect the likelihood of bill passing? Does it make it more likely or less likely for the bill to pass? More, more, more likely. likely. Both of these help in the lawmaking process, but you need to tell me how they help in the lawmaking process. What's a rider? A rider is an amendment you attach to a bill. Uh, it's usually federal funding for someone's state someone's state or someone's okay. district. So it's going to make it more likely for that congressman to vote yes on the bill because he would also be saying yes to funding for his home state and home district. And that's good for him because next election he can claim credit for that funding. Yeah. Everyone good? Everyone good with log rolling? Let's go to three. Anyone have any questions about gerrymandering? Okay, the next question, anyone can answer that next question for me. It's gerrymandering. Gerrymandering, so what we talked about yesterday, make sure you watch the video, it is um, the drawing of district lines in order to give an advantage to one party. The, the effect of the representation is... So, what's the goal of gerrymandering, guys? To make district elections, House of Representative elections, more competitive or less competitive? Less, less competitive. You want to make them less, which means if you're a House of Representative member, what, are the, what is the likelihood that you're going to get reelected again? It's very high. Because most districts in the United States have been so rigged that you're probably going to win. We know the outcome of the election every single time. Which means, as a House of Representative member, am I really accountable to my constituents? I can make wrong decisions, I can pass bad laws, and I'm probably gonna win my election again. 
So it makes congressmen less accountable for the decisions that they make in Congress, in the House of Representatives, anyway. All right, four. Let's talk about four, because some of you are getting this wrong. I do not just want you to tell me an advantage, like, oh, they have this guy. You need to tell me how that guy gives them an advantage in lawmaking. So both parties have an agenda. They have laws they want to pass. So what are the advantages um, that the majority party has over the minority party when it comes to passing a bill in that particular house? What's the most obvious advantage? Speaker of the House. Yeah, no, 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 that's not the obvious one. Uh, more, more, more votes. More votes. They have yeah. numerical advantage. If the majority party can keep their party members in line and voting the same way, they're always going to what? They're always going to win. They're always going to pass the laws the party wants them to pass and fail the laws the party wants them to kill. Because they just have the numerical advantage. In the House of Representatives, what's an advantage? The majority party elects who? Speaker. The Speaker of the House. Why is that an advantage? Don't just tell me that. Tell me why the Speaker of the House is an advantage. She is by he has the power to assign bills to committees, and with that power, he can affect the likelihood of a bill passing or not passing. Or she, in our case. Did you see what she did? Sorry? Did she read yeah, Trump's speech? Alright. Um, give me another advantage. Uh, what are committee chairs? All committee chairs? A lot of you put this on your thing. Don't put this. They're not elected. Committee chairs are not elected. They, it's usually automatic who's going to be the committee chair. You need to be two things. Experience. You need to have the most experience where? In, the, in uh, that committee. Yeah. That, in that specific, you need to be the longest serving member in that committee, but you also need to be from where? From the majority party. So you need to be two things. You need to be from the majority party and you need to um, be, oh, you need to be the longest serving member in that committee. That's not what I want you to put here, though. I want you to put, uh, I want you to tell me why um, committee members being from your party, why is that an advantage in lawmaking and pushing your agenda? What do committee chairs do? How do they affect the lawmaking process? Well, they bring in experts. Committees bring in experts. But that's not why they have, they, that gives them an advantage. What's another role of committee chairs? So if I was a committee, like if I was like yesterday, the House Science and Technology Committee, I have a bunch of bills that we need to do a hearing on. What does the committee chair do? He decides when are those bills are going to be heard. He does the schedule for his committee. He creates the schedule for his committee. And with that power, he can affect the likelihood of a bill passing or not passing. If he likes a bill, he can put it top priority. If he doesn't like a bill, he can bury it in the schedule. Does that make sense for everybody? So if this bill is liked by the party, he can put it on top. If it's not liked by the party, he can put it on the bottom of the agenda. So he sets the committee's agenda. He sets the committee's schedule, which can make it more likely or less likely for bills to pass. How many advantages is that? Three? Give me another one exclusively or specifically in the House of Representatives for that. All committees that exist in the Senate and the House of Representatives, the majority of their members have to be from where? From the majority party. So right now, the majority of everyone in the Senate, for example, all committees in the Senate have a majority of what kind of people? Republicans. Republican representatives. In the House of Representatives, Democratic representatives are in the majority of all committees. But I'm looking for a specific committee that can give you an advantage. The House of Representatives. The House of Representatives. The Democrats control all the committees in the House of Representatives, but the most important one is the House Rules Committee. Why? What do they do? They assign rules for debate. They can decide how much time the bill gets for debate. They can decide what kind of amendments. So. By being stricter on the rules or being loose on the rules, they can affect the likelihood of a bill passing or not passing. House Rules Committee is very important. 
Anyone else have any questions on four? Let's go to five. The house with the most checks on the President of the United States is the Senate. We talked about some of those checks today. Give me some checks that the Senate has, specifically the Senate. Not both houses, but specifically the Senate has over the President of the United States. Whatever your points. Whenever the President appoints someone to the judiciary, to ambassadorship, to the heads of agency, they need to be confirmed by the Senate, or they can be rejected by the Senate, like what they did to Merrick Garland. What else? Treaties. Treaties have to be ratified by the Senate, with the consent of the Senate. Or they can block those treaties, like what they did with the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. Give me another one. Give me another bench. What did the Senate do yesterday? Oh, they acquitted. They acquitted the President of the United States, but they could have just easily do, did what? Well, no, they can't impeach him. You guys remember what impeachment means? Yes. It means accusing uh, someone of a crime. Uh, the trial takes place where? Yes. In the Senate. They can acquit him like what they did yesterday, or they can declare him guilty. They can convict him and remove him from office. The Senate could have done that, but the Senate's controlled by Republicans. I think only one Republican voted yes. against him. Alright, let's go to six. Anyone have any question on six? Does anyone know the difference between a trustee and a delegate? Those of you that weren't here yesterday, make sure to watch the video. It's important that you, you have the weekend. I'm probably not going to see you tomorrow. Maybe I will. We'll review some more tomorrow if I see you tomorrow. But you have the lit. Right. Oh, yeah. uh, but you'll be done by then, probably. Probably. Oh, be tired. And, but we're not having a test tomorrow. That's fine. You don't have. You should study, but you don't have to tonight. But you have the weekend to study. Anyone have any questions on the trustee and delegate? Uh, trustee and delegate is how a congressman should behave. There are two different theories of how a congressman should behave. If you believe in a trustee model, you believe that. Representatives should make their own decisions when they're voting on bills, even if those decisions goes against their constituents' will. You follow what you believe in as a representative instead of following what your constituents want you to do. Because you were elected by them, they trust you to make the correct decisions for them, even if those decisions may be against what they want. Does that make sense? You know better than them. Delegate model is the opposite. Sometimes you forget what you want what you think is personally right, and you follow your constituents. If your constituents want you to vote yes, you're going to vote yes. You're like a puppet for your constituents. That make sense? That doesn't replace actually watching the video because it's a lot more stuff on it. Same thing for you, right? Seven. A bunch of questions on multiple choice about mandatory and discretionary. Make sure you know what they are. Make sure you give me an accurate definition. If it's not accurate, I'm going to count it wrong. Going good? With mandatory or discretionary? Discretionary is what's left over for mandatory. Not really. Uh, yeah. More like yeah. Yeah. Mandatory, mandatory spending is federal spending that cannot be easily adjusted. It's automatic spending. We've committed to it by law. Usually, it's spending that we do on entitlement programs like Medicare and Social Security. While discretionary spending is adjusted, not just it's easily adjusted, it is adjusted every single year by Congress. When they're doing the what? Well, the budget and the appropriations, that's when they, do, um, they, do, they decide on discretionary spending. The problem today is more of the far federal money has to go on and pay for what? mandatory spending because mandatory spending is increasing. So federal funds have to be dead more and more dedicated to paying mandatory spending. Which means we put pressure on what type of spending? Discretionary spending because we don't have as much money anymore. Because we're spending most of it on mandatory. Um, how do we solve that problem? Uh, three, 
We can raise taxes, so we can raise revenue to accommodate for both man the increasing mandatory spending and for discretionary spending. What else can we do? We can change the law and cut mandatory spending, cut Social Security, cut Medicare. And the last one is we can run a deficit, which means we can borrow more money. Huh? Raise taxes. We can change a lot of cut mandatory spending. All right, let's go to eight. Oh, eight is easy. Make sure you, do, you look at your homework assignment. Nine, going to be on your exam. Anyone have any questions about the two cases we talked about today? These cases have two things in common. They're both about what? They're both about the 14th Amendment Sacred Protection Clause, they're both about discrimination, and they're both about redistricting. Make sure you can describe each one of these cases too. Alright guys, to give you an incentive, some of you may need it. If you get an A on your multiple choice section, there's going to be two parts. There's an FRQ, which we're going to do first, and then multiple choice. I'll give you two hundreds on a quiz for it. Get an A on Monday. It's 89.5. It's a